what we're going to do, we're going to show about a six minute clip that relates to the message today. So yeah, there. And then we'll turn on all the lights afterwards. But it's a, like I said, six minutes, and it's a, it's to me very inspiring little clip here. It's from the movie Facing the Giants. How many of you saw that movie, Facing the Giants? A few of you did. It's a good movie. I recommend it. Uh, I like uh, it's inspirational, and also it's about football. I like football, so it, it, uh, it's a good one. But we're talking today about faith. We're talking about five things that increase your faith, and we're taking one a week. Last week, we talked about practical teaching. In order for us to grow, we need practical teaching. And we need teaching on doctrine. I'm a big believer in doctrine. We don't get that much in our church. But I'm also a big believer in putting it into practice. It's not what you know, it's what you do. And so we receive knowledge, but what do we do with it? And it's like a man who looks in the mirror and does nothing. Now, of course, I can get away with that, but not everybody can. <laughs> By the way, I've got a new hairstyle. Anybody notice? Is my hair messed up? <laughs> but uh, anyway, if you look in the mirror, if you want to do something about it, you, know, you want to fix it. And the Word of God is like a mirror when we learn. So one of the ways we learn is through practical teaching, but also providential relationships. I'm going to explain that in a minute. But for us to grow, we need people around us to stir us, to move us, to help us, to move us out of that comfort zone. We need a coach. We need a teacher. We need uh, someone to help us. So let's look at this video, and then we're, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay. We're going high. <laughs> Keep moving, bro. That's it. That's it. That's it. 
And there's some truth in what we say, but let me tell you, it's a common. Well, that's just the way I am. Well, it may be the way you are, but God wants to change the way you are. 
God, you know, somebody say, well, I'm just not comfortable like that. You know, y'all may not realize this, but I was tremendously shy when I was young. I remember going to Sunday school, and I hated Sunday school. My mama would get me up and put me on clothes and put a tie around my neck. That is torture. I'm against it, and that's why I don't wear a tie. Only at funerals and some weddings, I will wear a tie. If I get out of wearing a tie, I will not wear it. Don't like it. And uh, Jesus didn't wear a tie. <laughs> so I, I know some people, I believe you ought to be saying about to wear a tie when you preach. No, it's not. Jesus did not. So, uh, anyway, that's not a brand on tie. So, Mom used to get me up and take me to Sunday school. And I remember going to Sunday We didn't go much. But I remember when I was a teenager, I went. You know why I went? There was a girl in Sunday school. Uh, there's always a girl somewhere. Amen. Uh, especially when you're a teenager. So I went to Sunday school, and you know what they did? They had this little book, they gave me one, and they said, You read this, and you read that page, and you read this page, and you read this page, and you read it. And man, I was scared to death. I hated to read. I especially hated to read out loud because I was dyslexic. They didn't call it dyslexic back then, they called it dumb. But I was dyslexic, and, and man, those big old hard words in the Bible. And I went down there and I read, it and I said, when I got finished, I said to myself, I'll never come here again. That's why I don't like making people read in Sunday school and all. But anyway, I uh, I hated church. I, and I remember after I got saved, I received Christ my Savior, and then I wanted to go to Sunday school and learn, but you know what? I was scared. I was scared to death. I was literally sitting in there shaking. I think it's me to pray. I think, you know, I'm not good praying by myself, much less out loud. And boy, I was really scared. And I remember when the first time they asked me to pray, and I stuttered out a little bit. Of, you know, I just said a few things and got it over with, but I was scared to death. But you know, the first time you do something, you're always scared. There's some people who say, I, you know, I've had men. I've said, Brother Carl, I'll come to church. Just don't call on me and pray. And I, I won't do it. I'll, I'll hold to their wishes. But I've had some men come and I said, Have you ever prayed out loud enough? Well, we want you to do it. No matter what you say. If you say, Dear Lord, bless us. Amen. That's a beginning. And by the way, it, it doesn't matter what people think, but, but that's how you grow. You get out of your comfort zone. Some people say, I could never witness. That's just not the way I am. I'm not an outgoing person. Well, let me ask you something. Are you going to accept how you are and the status quo, or are you going to obey God and say, I'm going to learn to talk to people? I've already told you I was scared to death to get up and give a speech. I had science class in the ninth grade, and they said, you got to do a project and get up and tell the whole class. And I wouldn't do it. I told the teacher, I'm not going to do it. And he said, why not? And I said, I'm scared to death to talk to people. He said, I tell you what, do your project. You won't have to, I'll cut you down one grade, but at least you won't get a zero. And so he let me not give a speech, but I did the work. It was excellent work on that. Uh, my charts were really, really good. But anyway, I did not give a speech. And that's just the way I am. I'm just not an outgoing person. Well, say, God, I want to become an outgoing person. Well, I'm just kind of quiet. Well, then whisper when you give your testimony. But give your testimony. Tell people about Jesus. And let your faith grow. So relationships help us to grow. I remember uh, when I was uh, I was not, I was 17 years old, right before my birthday. There was a church in Nashville. I'll tell you which church it is. They're moving right down the road here. They're trying to build a building at Metro 11, but uh, uh, it's Cambridge Free Will Baptist. It used to be a Newmont Free Will Baptist, and I went there one New Year's Eve. They were having a New Year's Eve watch night service. I was as lost as last year's Easter. And I didn't care about church. Guess why I went? You figured it out. <laughs> I don't have to tell you. But I went to church, and that's where I met Kathy. I actually met her before, but uh, uh, 
I don't really remember that. She tells me that. <laughs> but this was a wonderful day in her life because she had the opportunity of a lifetime. She got to meet me. And so uh, uh, I say that very humbly. But, uh, anyway, I was there, and they, they showed a movie, and I forgot the movie. And then they had a discussion, and they were sharing. And it was moving. I was under conviction. I was in that youth group, and I was under conviction. But I had a cousin named Bobby Harden. Bobby and I, we hung out together. We did everything together. And uh, you know why he was there? A girl. And uh, he got, but something happened to Bobby that night. He got saved. I'm like, whoa, what are you doing, Bobby? Yeah, I was under conviction, but I could resist. You couldn't resist. And something happened to Bobby. And I mean, he changed. And I thought, well, that just won't last long. He said, from now on, no more drinking in my car. Which is a good idea when you're saved or lost. <laughs> but he said, no beer in my car. I'm going to church. Man, he really changed. And it bugged me. I'm like, wow. In one month, in two months, in three months, and he was still living, going to church. I'm like, you actually want to go to church? That's weird, man. It is weird. People who are lost don't want to go to church. It's boring. It's awkward. But he wanted to go to church. And man, that worked on me. I saw a guy change. I mean, a guy who was a lot worse than I was. I mean, he was a... I was a sinner, but he was really a sinner. And I'd be happy to tell him that uh, when I see him. He already knows it. Um, but he got saved. And he changed my opinion of Christians. And I want you to know it was three and a half months later that I was at a revival meeting. He wasn't there, but I received Christ as my Savior. So he influenced me to come to Christ. And by the way, he's a, a he's a faithful servant at his church uh, down down near Spring Hill area. Uh, to this day, he served the Lord, but he had an influence on me. And I could tell, tell you about others. I told you last week about a Sunday school teacher who helped me when I was first saved. I remember when I was pastoring in East Tennessee, we we were having a, a hard time. The ministry was just hard, and we were struggling. And, and we, we had a group of people, and they were really, really nice people. I love them. They may be listening for this, and I love them, but they were a little bit dead. I mean, I would tell a really good joke, and they just sat there and stared at me. The only ones laughing were my kids, because they were like, Daddy's vomiting up there, man. <laughs> I mean, he's telling jokes, and nobody's getting it. And I, and I mean, it was, and I was struggling. I was trying to get some life in the church. You know, I had one guy there say, I don't care what you say, brother, bro, I ain't going to raise my hands. I'll tell you these people raise their hands when they're saying, you ain't going to say me doing that. And I said, Billy, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. But don't criticize those who do it. Because I would sometimes raise my hand. And uh, God began to loose us. Lord, loose us. Let us. I mean, I just pray, Lord, let us sing, let the wind is rattle. And these people, well, I'm so scared somebody will hear me sing. Well, you ought to, if you don't sing good, who cares? Sing to Jesus. Sing to the Lord. Let that be boys. Let it rain. Let these windows rattle. And boy, it wasn't long until, you know, I started preaching on Jesus. And, I started, and boy, you know, I saw some hands lifted. And I looked over here in the corner and there was Billy Dobbins. Billy's my buddy did that. I love him. And uh, I saw him with his hands lifted. And he was praising the Lord. I saw him at a funeral recently. He said, Brother Carl, I'm going to the assembly. I'm sorry. I've been bad. I've been a long time. I was getting so depressed. <laughs> he said, Man, God, I'm alive. I need something alive in it. And so that's why I'm going to bag this kid a Pentecostal heart to hold the witness to me. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but God began to loosen him up and, and free him up now. He's, uh, he's helping the others. And, he seems to come up here and visit with us. I hope he will one of these days. But 
relationship. Now you say, Brother Carl, if it's providential relationship, if it's God that does it, why are you preaching to us? It's God that's going to do it. Then uh, we, we can't just make it happen. No, we can't make it happen, but we can sure put ourselves in an environment where it will happen. You know, if I was praying for a job, I would not only pray, but I'd go look at it. It'd be bad for me to say, Lord, give me a job, but I'm not going to go out and look. If I was a young lady looking for a man, I would not only pray, but I might comb my hair every day. I might use the other and I might go where some guys are, some good Christian guys. Amen. Now I tell you, I'm not going to listen. Be careful where you go looking for a man because I don't want to catch the wrong kind. I tell you, there's some girls, I, I don't know what it is, but I tell you what, they bring, they'll bring some old guy to church who looks worse than what my dog used to bring home. What is it about some of these girls that they meet some guy that turn into Lady God? Oh, it's like they lose their mind. There you, go. you know, it's like, and by the way, I have this theory that when you get infatuated with a guy for about eight or nine months, you lose your mind. You can't reason with him. Because they're in love. And I tell you, next week's Valentine, I will say this sermon for you. Be careful who you hang out with. Jump ahead of myself. Number one, let me give you some things about this. We need to fight our culture when it comes to relationships. Now, I'm talking about good or bad. And I'll tell you, I can name some people who have been bad influences on me. I know of a man, and I'm not going to say his name because these, these are out in the cyberspace. These sermons go around the world. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. Let me see. Can I sound like Billy Graham? Thousands are coming. We can be more. Uh, that would never happen. <laughs> Three are coming. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, enough of that. But, uh, you know, I, I know some guys who really influenced me for bad. There's one guy who, uh, man, I was totally negative. Everything. Um, never smiled. How you doing today? Okay, under the circumstances. I want to say, what are you doing under there? <laughs> That's no place to be. But oh, the world is coming to an end. Sounds like some of my sermons I do. <laughs> I do it with a smile on my face. But uh, there's something you can be around that will drag you down. So you know what you do? Don't hang around them much. I'm telling you, really, there are some people you shouldn't be around much because they'll pull you down. I don't be around people lifting me up. Amen. Have you ever been around people like that? Boy, they're just positive. They're, that they're strong in their faith and they encourage you. Have you ever been around those people that pull you down? I tell you, I'm going to bless them with my absence as quick as I can. But number one, we've got to fight our culture. We're living in a culture where we're busy, we're on the computer. We're watching TV. Many of us in the culture today know very little about our neighbors. And I tell you, I must confess that I don't know a whole lot about my neighbors not like all to. But you know what we do? We drive in the driveway. We push a button. The back cave opens. We drive in. The back cave closes. And we don't see the world until we open it again. We're in our car. We come out. And that's the kind of culture we're in. And that's why we need to fight the culture. That's why I want to fight here in our church. That's why we're having small groups. I want to encourage you to get in a small group. It may be uncomfortable, but, but so what? It might be out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. And get to know some people. And, and develop some relationships and friendships. Where you'd be willing to, to, to help. I tell you, sometimes we get calls. Uh, not as much here because we're not in the yellow pages, but... Uh, in other churches, I get calls and people want help. And I say, what about your church? Won't your church help you? Well, I don't go to church. See, that's a problem. In the old days, people used to sit on their porch and rock in a rock. 
My father-in-law, man, he sat outside on the porch, out in the garage. He said, just sat out there and watched people go out by the way. Who was that? I don't know. He said, I'm a friendly guy. You know? I'm a friendly guy. Neighbors would come over, sat down, and talk a while. Sunday afternoon, y'all seen Andy Griffith. You know how he is. He'd get his guitar out, ain't but he'd make some homemade ice cream. <laughs> and Bobby Blues and his kind eat some ice cream. I tell you what, you can't get much better than that. You know what we're doing? We're too busy on the computer, on the internet. And I'm not against that. I do that a lot. I learn through, through that. But I tell you, there's got to be times when we are with other people that can influence us and that we can influence them. There used to be a time, a long, long time ago, some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, but women used to can. You know what I'm talking about, can? Anybody here know what can means? It's not other yogurt. No, I'm talking about can. <laughs> Fruit and vegetables. Pickles. And you know what? These women would get together, their husbands would be out working in the farm, and these women would get together and they would can. And you know what they'd do while they were canning? What do you think women would do while they're canning? They'd be talking. And they'd be talking about each other. And you know what the main subject was? Their husbands. <laughs> well, does your husband do that? He sure does. Why do they do that? I don't do do you know what that was? That was he. They didn't need to go to the psychiatrist and pay $100 for 30 minutes. They just get together and they would talk. And the older women would help teach the younger women. And they would teach them things through experience and through their own life. And they would have a in impression on those people because of the relationship that we had, that they had. We don't do that anymore. You know what the men would do? They get together, they might raise a barn together. They get together, do projects and work together. And we've lost that in this culture. So you know what I want to encourage you to do? You want to grow spiritually, you know what you need to do? Get, some, get around some people that are spiritual. And talk about the things of God. I know we like to talk about football, nothing wrong with that. I like to talk about baseball, I like to talk about sports. But every now and then we all talk about Jesus. Amen. Talk about the Bible. I was reading this. What do you think about that? Well, I was reading about the rapture. And uh, what do you think? Are we going to be raptured out before or after the tribulation? That'll stir some conversation. Won't it? And we might both learn some things. Amen. I'm not 100% right. I'm only 99 and 5 tenths percent right. So that means somebody knows something I don't know. That, therefore, everybody is my teacher because everybody knows something I don't know. So I can learn something from everybody. So we ought to, we ought to get together and talk. Let me move on. God will stay here. We need to fight our culture, but not only fight our culture, we need to fight our nature. Our nature is to hold everything in. Now, especially us guys. I know how guys are because I am one. I mean, we've got to go and what the Paul's going to say, or my leader's going to say, share an embarrassing moment in your life. That's what we did this week. It was fun, too. I learned some things. It's good. I know more about y'all than. Now, I mean, hey, don't you try to leave the church? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You get mad and say, I'm leaving. Uh -uh. I got something on you, buddy. I'm going to tell everybody what you said in growth group. You know what? It's good to learn about people. We're so comfortable. I don't want people to know who I really am. I got to hide. Why don't we just do a Bible study and don't ask those personal questions? Well, Carl, why don't you just preach a sermon and I'll just sit here and be quiet? Come on, that's it. Come on, open up a little bit. You don't have to open up all the way at first, just a little bit, and then you'll get better. And then you'll say, well, what is it so bad? Old devil says, if they know the real you, they won't like you. Hey, we probably won't like you anyway. Go ahead and share. Amen. Amen. <laughs> No, let me tell you something. The truth is, we'll love you more. I'm a lot of real you. I can't love only you, me, 
real. Come on, let's get honest. If you're struggling, share it. We can pray for you. But men, no, we don't want to do that. We're tough. We can have it. No, we can't. Oh, it's so freeing to get rid of No skeletons in the closet. I'm not hiding. Let's share. Our old pride that won't do. I don't need anybody. I can do it all by myself. No, you can't. I just want to be alone. It's awkward. Listen, I challenge you. Have an awkward conversation. Go up to somebody you don't know and start a conversation. This morning, I got a bird. Got my Bible. Went to McDonald's. The waitress at Stage and Shade wasn't going to be there. She gives me a deal. I don't pay for coffee. So I knew I had to pay the full amount, so I went to McDonald's. Thought I'd share that with you. And while I'm there, <clears throat> reading my Bible, there's a guy beside me and his wife. He goes, It looks like you're preparing for church today. I said, Yes, I am. And I said, where do you go to church? He said, I go to Christ Church. I thought our church was Christ Church. But anyway, uh, and I went at Christ Church. And I said, and we got to talk. And we got to have a good conversation. But he had, you know, somebody had to start the conversation. And I tell you, we're so afraid. What are we afraid of? I don't want to talk about Jesus. I'll talk about the weather. I'll talk about sports. I don't want to talk about Jesus. Are you ashamed of it? We need to share. I can go on and on. Let me just encourage you to speak up. There was a, a friend of mine. He's still a friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. But uh, he was very, very timid. Had a terrible inferiority complex. And we went down here to show him, right down here, right down the road here. And uh, he said, uh, they were about to, he was about to go to a missions conference, and he was a missionary, and he said that he needed money. He said, Look, I'm just afraid to talk to people. You know, I don't, I don't want to talk about my need. And I tell you, if a missionary doesn't talk about needing money, he's in trouble. I teach missionaries, you shake hands like this. <laughs> Honestly, listen, you may not like it, but missionaries, if they don't get money, they can't go. So they gotta have money. And so I was said to him, just timid and shy. I said, here's what I want you to do. First of all, don't you sit on the back. You sit on up near the front. We want some of the back rows to be high. I want some of be back there right on the high. I said, be a front row seat. And I said, I want you to go up to everybody you know, and even if you don't know, you go up to look them in the eyes, shake their hand, tell them who you are, and you be aggressive, and you tell them what you're doing, and you tell them you're going to be a missionary, and you tell you know, just go up to them and talk. You say, Brother Paul, how do you know people are doing it? Because I know I used to be so afraid of people. I'd sit on the back row and duck and hope they don't call on me for nothing, and then slip out the back door and get in the car and go. And one day I just had to change. Well, that's just not the way I am. Yeah, I know. Who wants to change? Who wants to stay how you are all the time? Don't you want to change? Don't you want to grow? Are you just going to accept? Well, that's the way I am. Now, there's parts of us we can't change. There's parts of our personality that God put there. But I tell you, there's some things that we can change. And we all want to grow. A few days later, I met that guy. He said, Brother Carl, it was awesome. I just got, I walked in that room. I sat on the front row. I said, this one, I'm going to call everybody. And I went to him, and I shook their hand. I looked him in the eye. I told him who I was. He said, man, my confidence began to build. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> because you're, you're afraid people won't like you. You might get rejected. So what? That's usually a lie. Most people will reject you. Listen, if you don't even offer yourself, they've already ejected, uh, rejected you. Don't accept a no until they say no, okay? 
But he said it was awesome. Man, I had a great time. I met some wonderful people that I had never met. But I snuck in, sat in the back, and left early. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to preach to you on the back row. Because some of you got good reasons to sit on the back row. But what I am saying is don't hide and don't try to, to, uh, uh, to don't be afraid to meet people and talk to people and be impressive. I know God is going to make things happen, but you need to put yourself in a position to allow God to do that. Do we have the first Corinthians first? See if we can get that up on the screen. And then we're going to close in just a minute. Well, okay, that's King James. It's a little different in, in my version. Let me give it to you in my version here. Be not deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. Here's the last point I'm going to close. Be careful who you run with. Especially, this, this is it for everybody, but especially teenagers. I, uh, I had a, a man who uh, was in our church years ago. And his kids turned out great. I mean, he had good, solid, strong spiritual kids. And so I just went up to him and I said, I said, well, what did you do? What, what would you say is the, one of the most important things that had to do with kids? And he you know, told me really strange. I had to say, you know, pray more, you know, discipline more, be consistent with discipline. That's what I was kind of fearing him to say. Here's what he said. Don't let your teenage kids work outside the home to uh, wow. I said, what do you mean? He said, I know these people, they'll lift their kids when they're 15, 16, 17 years old, and they'll get and they'll get a job at McDonald's and everybody there is against God. None of them are Christians and those people will influence your kids to do He said it'd be better let them stay home. If you want to take them to work, let them work at home. Let them wash their clothes, let them clean their room, let them Things like that. But he said, don't put them in a bad environment too early. And, you know, I look back on uh, my kids and my girls, and we were fortunate. My girls got to work in a Christian environment. I worked at the preschool, and they got all the teachers were Christians, and that was great. Let them learn in a Christian environment. Because I don't care who you are, if you're in the wrong environment, it'll tempt you to do wrong. I'm going to tell one story in my clothes. My wife, Kathy, uh, went to Cone High School. By the way, I'm asking about this week. I think went to Cone. I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, she went to Cone High School, which is now Pearl Cone, over in West Nashville. I went to Glencliff High School. And there was one time where Glencliff was playing Pearl in the basketball. So we wanted to go. So here's the dilemma. Do we sit on the Glencliff side where we root for Glencliff or do we sit on the Cone side where we root for Cone? Being, being the brilliant person that I am, I said, why don't we sit one half on one side and the other half on the other side? And so the first half we sat on the Glencliff side. And man, we were cheering and Young and stop the board. I tell you, you go to a high school game now, it ain't good if you say. Back in our day, man, we, the bleachers shook. We would stomp those bleachers. And uh, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And man, we were yelling, our team would get us for And I tell you, I, I, I'm kind of meek and mild. Some of y'all, Don and my sons, know that when I get at a football game or something, I can really embarrass you to death. Because I yell, I scream, I yell you know, at the referees. Too. You know, it's not right. I repent afterwards, but I'm not. You're blind as a bat, and you can't see, and you're an idiot, and all those things. I really do. It's really embarrassing. Uh, but anyway, I'm in the game, and I'm yelling for our team. Of course, at halftime, Wayne Cliff was winning, being the better school. And uh, so then we go over on the other side, on the common side. And our team gets the ball, runs down the field, and scores a basket. And I jump up, and I'm like, yay! And I'm just yelling. And then I look around, and everybody's looking at me. And I 
I said that now. And we got the ball again and scored, and I said, Being in a different environment affected my zeal for my team. I know some of you wouldn't affect. My son, my son would have been in 12 fights with the other team. <laughs> Isn't that right, Jim? He, he loves it. He'll be like, let's go to the other team. <laughs> <laughs> I am not kidding. He can, you know, I'm like, he, he called me one time and said, Dad, they kicked me out of the game. I said, you get in a fight. I said, okay. <laughs> go, to one of the, go to a restaurant and watch this game. <laughs> that was the time to But anyway, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, most people, most normal people, would, uh, would not, you know, being in the wrong crowd will affect you. It'll affect, it'll affect all of us, not just to you. So you know what that means? i got to be careful who I run with. There are certain preachers that I, if they, if they have a flat tire, I'll help them. I love them in Christ Jesus, but I tell you what, I'm not going to hang out with them if they don't believe the Bible is inspired word of God. You say, Brother Carl, well, how are you going to help them to believe it? Well, it don't work that way. Usually they'll help me not to believe If you have a bad apple in a barrel, you don't put good apples in there to turn the bad one good. You know what will happen? The bad one will turn the good ones bad. That's the way of the nature of, of man is. And I know people that used to take a stand and now they won't because they hung around the wrong crowd and the wrong crowd has influenced them. And you know, they'll say, they're not so bad. Yeah, they don't believe in the Bible and, and you know, they don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. But you know, they're really nice guys. Listen, all liberals are nice guys. They're not against anything. They're for everything. They're just like, let's just bless everybody. Listen, as a shepherd, it's my job to keep you from the wolves. And there are false teachers out there. There are wolves. And I'm going to warn you about them. Or we'll become just like them. So what are you saying? I'm going to close. I'm saying relationships are very important. And what that means, I'm going to try to hang out with people that are spiritual. I'm going to try to hang out with people. And, and, and here's what we ought to do at one point in our lives. I want to be around people that will lift me up. And also, I want to be a lifter of, of people myself. So I have some people that may be um, baby Christians, new Christians, and I'm going to help to lift them up. But I also need to be around people that stimulate my thinking, that encourage my faith, that lift me up. See, some of you are like, ah, growth groups, man, it's cold, it's dark, it's 6.30, I'm not exactly sure where to go. And so you're hesitant to go. And you're tired, I know you're tired. You work all day, you're all your time. But let me tell you something, being tired is not an excuse. We need to grow. You need to be committed to it. And that means I'm going to take a couple of hours out of my week and hang around some spiritual people that will help me grow. I want to give up some things that I might enjoy doing. Listen, what we're asking is not hard. And I hope that it will come to a place where you will say, Oh, I need to be around my friends. I tell you, when this old world punches you in the nose, and I tell you, it will. Just hang around the ball. You'll get a phone call or something will happen, and it's the old devil saying, I'm going to give you a gift. And man, it hurts. You know what I'm thankful? That not only can I do it in my life, but my God will bring people around me that will help me, and strengthen me, and encourage me. So as we're on this journey to grow, I hope you're on the journey. Do you want to grow? Do you want to be different next year? Do you want to come out of your comfort zone? Do you want to go further with God? Then get on this journey. Practical teaching. You need to get under practical teaching. You need some providential relationships. You need to get under some people and learn and hang out with people 
And you know what? Some of you need to quit hanging out with some people that bring you down. I don't mean to be rude or unkind, but you just you just need to be around people that are going to help you and not hear you. Hey, he got on time. He was struggling in his marriage. He was he was in the army. He told me, he said, Brother Carl, I've got this problem. I said, what is it? He said, you know, me and my wife were struggling, and years ago, I was unfaithful to her years ago, and I'm, I'm so sorry that it was. But sometimes I'll be driving down the road, and I'll hear a song on the radio, and it'll remind me of this other point. And it, it bothers me. He said, Brother Carl, I'm struggling with this. You know what I told him? I said, he depends on paper now because then it's very important. Don't listen to the radio. Oh. Why don't you get you some tapes and listen to Christian music? I would recommend getting a CD of Kathleen Cardelli. By the way, Kathleen, we're showing you now a video for church, so... You can go far, far away and still go down to <laughs> Why not listen to good stuff? Does that make sense to you? See, some of those things are triggers. You know, they trigger your thinking. Well, just, just do a little from Man, when I'm around this person, he just discourages me. Well, guess what? I don't have him. When you can help him. Do you want to grow? I hope you do. Let's grow together. Times are getting tough, and I think they're going to get tougher. You know what? We're going to need one. Faith in our mind. We're going to need one another. We're going to need encouragement. So let's do it. Let's go for prayer.